Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I know we're all sorts of different places and time zones and, uh, and some people are, are even in tomorrow. So um, welcome to uh, a webinar here with the uh, UDIRN. Um, I'm gonna facilitate the first several slides and then uh, the rest of the, the group, Kavita, George, and Chris, Christine would join us. We're going to be on uh, several different locations. Uh, of course, we're in the Google Doc for feedback. Uh, you can chat as long uh, as, along as well. That's at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we're live streaming, as some of us already know, on YouTube. And of course, we're tweeting there at the um, higher end sign there. So feel free to interact with us in, in several different ways. And uh, Mackenzie and Kavita and others will be monitoring these different components and we'll be trying to respond as, as things go along. Kavita, you're controlling the slides, right? Yep, I know, I got it, sorry. Okay. Just playing with this here, okay, got it. Great, so um, what we're gonna focus on today will be some re reporting criteria that we had a URL for just a moment ago and we'll get to in just another moment. Um, this is available via the UDL IRN website under the research pages. Uh, it's been available for a little bit and there's uh, the URL again. Um, the reporting criteria um, uh, is available and again, we're gonna kind of walk through the process today of what we did uh, over a series of several months, uh, both on site as well as virtual. And that's kind of our focus is to kind of walk you through elements of the criteria, uh, give you a little exposure to it, give you a little practice with it, and kind of give you not only the background, but where we are and hopefully where we're going with this criteria to move uh, UDL forward in terms of further implementation and understanding. The folks that were involved with the development, uh, most of us are here, and uh, actually we'll let each of everyone say hello if you would. So Kavita, why don't you start and we'll kind of go across the screen saying hello. Hey, hi everybody, I'm Kavita Rao. I'm a professor at the University of Hawaii. I see some familiar names on our attendee list. Um, so welcome and thanks for being here. Uh, hi, I'm George Van Horn. I'm the Director of Special Education with Bartholomew Consolidated School Corporation in Columbus, Indiana. And I'm Chris Grimer Farrell from Australia. I have a dual role. I'm an honorary a professor at UNSW, and I'm also um, leading special education and diverse learning needs for across um, a, a New South Wales school sector. Great. I just wanted to say that um, Dave Edderburn is traveling internationally, so he couldn't be with us today. And uh, Shira is in Israel, and it's 3 a.m. her time. So she said she's sorry, but she's fast asleep. So, but they are integral to the development of this. So um, this is the whole group that was involved in developing these criteria. And let's tell you a little bit about that. Uh, so first of all, so uh, my name is Sean Smith. Uh, I'm a faculty member of the University of Kansas, and uh, was there at the, the first meeting when the IRN got started in Chicago uh, several years back uh, with George and several others. Um, as we move forward within the IRN, uh, the research group, uh, of course, has been doing a number of things. And back at a pre-conference in March of 2017 in Orlando, we got together a group. Uh, we actually got several groups together. And from the different groups, a different product originated. And from our uh, group, uh, we, we focused in on this idea of uh, how do we determine universal design for learning within the literature? And so that, and that's very, very basic, and Kavita will take on, on in just a moment, but, but our focus here was, you know, how does UDL practice, uh, how is it applied to practice? Um, what's a UDL-based lesson? And, and the application was of some researchers, practitioners, and our group, as you can see, is uh, represented from that. Uh, from that, we developed the criteria through a number of different elements, which we'll describe and of course, we created it in terms of outcomes for the website for use. And we've actually, will refer to some work we've been doing with it uh, for further uh, understanding basis of overall scholarship. So that's, that's just a, a bit of a tip of the iceberg. Kavita will get into the details here right now. Okay, thanks, Sean. So when we convened in March um, 2017, over a year ago in Orlando, our work group, the six of us, talked about what do we know about UDL and what are some things we need to know? What, what are some important priorities that we have? So we discussed the fact that we know that when CAS developed UDL, it's, they were based on 
research evidence. So the checkpoints of UDL, those 31 checkpoints and the guidelines are based on evidence-based, the, the um, evidence-based. And if you go to CAS website, they actually, they'll, you can click on each checkpoint and see what research the checkpoints come from. So we know that it was developed with a research base. But in the past two decades, researchers have also been trying to establish, how do you use this framework? What is the research behind using the whole framework towards practices, not just the individual checkpoints? So when we talked about the literature that exists, what we find is that people describe their use of UDL in different ways. Some people will say, I'm using UDL, I'm using the principles of UDL at the beginning of an article, and then not really enumerate what they did. Other researchers will go into great detail. Um, some people will tell you how they're using UDL in one part, but not another. So as we talked about this base that was there, our group discussed the fact that um, it would be good to have some consistency in how people report on their use of UDL. And if, if we can have some consistency, we can start looking at what effective applications are across different reporting, different articles, different things that people report out on. Um, we might be able to find some effective implementation models um, for classrooms, for schools, for districts. So that was kind of the, the initial discussion that we started having at our when we met in March. And, the group came up with kind of th this was what we wanted to do with our we decided to spend a year working on this and uh, we wanted to um, identify we actually wanted to come up with some criteria or guidelines to make a UDL claim and um, I want to attribute that those words to Dave Edeburn because it's something he's been saying for many years it's in his article his seminal article from 2011 the 10 propositions of UDL that m many of us are familiar with he talks about the fact that we to make a UDL claim we need to have some common things present so we thought well it would be nice to have some some basis for making a UDL claim um, our group also discussed that we wanted this to be useful both for reporting on a UDL intervention or a practice, but also for designing. So whether you're actually writing an article or a report or you are designing a study um, or an intervention, it would be useful to know what should be in there. And then the third thing that our group felt strongly about was we didn't want it to be just something for researchers to do. We wanted it to be useful for researchers and practitioners. So as we developed it, we um, really focused on how to make the wording relevant for more than for 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 several groups and stakeholders. Um, and then after the Orlando meeting, we met online um, almost monthly for several months, for six or seven months. Um, that was quite a feat because we were to find a time that works for everybody from Hawaii to Australia to Israel to the continental US was quite a feat, but we did it. We met several times over Zoom. Um, and then we went through um, kind of a systematic process to develop them. First, we looked at different types of criteria and standards in related fields like the health professions. Uh, we looked at the Starlight standards, the PRISMA standards for meta-analyses and systematic reviews, the CEC quality indicators. So we looked at all of these to get an idea of the types of formats and structures that people use for these kind of guidelines and then talk about what types of, you know, what we wanted to do with ours. Um, after we looked at that, we, came up with some object objectives for the UDL RCs that we were developing. And we decided that what we wanted them to do was um, define the essential elements of UDL, provide a set of guidelines, and support clear reporting. And the most important point that I want to make here is that our group were, felt really strongly that we didn't want to come up with a set of standards or quality indicators. We didn't want to tell people what to do. Um, we were not interested in saying this is good or this is bad. That, is, that was not at all our intention. The intention was just to lay out some basic things that need to be present. When you say you're doing UDL or applying UDL or using UDL, uh, we wanted guidelines that just had people um, define a few factors of what that means. So we also wanted to honor the, the inherent flexibility of UDL. The way CAST has developed the UDL framework, it is a very flexible instructional design framework that can be used for um, many purposes. It can be used for K through 12, higher education, adult learning. It can be used in various settings for different types of learners. So we liked that flexibility. So we, did, we wanted the wording to remain flexible so that no matter who you are, how you want to use UDL, you can. Uh, we didn't, so we just wanted some common things that you would tell us about how you're using UDL. So that was an important piece of what we wanted to do. So based on that, 
we came up with three guiding tenets for the UDL reporting criteria. You can actually find these on the document if you've downloaded and printed it. It's on page two of the UDL reporting criteria. We put it right up front. The three things that were really important we wanted to keep it simple. When we looked at all the other guidelines, there are some that are very detailed. They go into a lot of things with, that you can rate. We decided keeping it simple makes sense because people are more likely to use it if it's simple. So we came up with three main categories with only two to three criteria per category. And um, so it's basically just over a page long, hopefully easy to use and appealing to use. Um, we also wanted to keep it essential. So the thing with UDL is it means so many things to so many people. So we did not want to try to you know, have Sean's lens or Chris's lens or my lens or George's lens on UDL. We wanted to focus on some of the essential things that all of us can agree are part of UDL. So we'll talk a little on the next slide about what those are. And then the other, the third thing, we wanted these to be non-evaluative. And that goes back to the thing about we weren't trying to establish standards. We're not trying to evaluate whether someone is using UDL well or badly or too much or too little. That was not our purpose. When you look at our criteria, we're, it's just a yes, no rating. Is it there or is it not there? Um, we did recognize that there are people who are going to use the criteria who do want to make a uh, quality assessment. So they're welcome to. There's a notes column. So if you wanted to add a layer of looking at how much UDL is used or how many checkpoints are used or how somebody did it or if engagement is addressed, you can add a layer to the report, the, um, whatever you're looking at by using the notes column. So we wanted to be clear that um, we were not looking for any amount of UDL. We're not looking for people to use a certain number of checkpoints. You can use the ones that make sense for whatever you're doing. So that's the, this is some of the contextual features of the, the reporting criteria. So again, here's the, the URL. We've already put that up. I'm just putting this up in case you came in um, after the beginning. Um, uh, if you will go to this, we're gonna be using these for the next few slides to do a little activity. It's also available over in the chat window. There's a link that uh, Mackenzie put in there that you can just click on it and go right there. Thanks, Sean. So before we start using it, I just wanted to go over those three categories and the two or three criteria per category and how we came up with them. So if you look at number one and two, learner variability and environment and proactive and intentional design, those are those essential elements of UDL that I think pretty much everybody in the UDL field will agree that learner variability is a really important facet of using UDL. Proactive and intentional design, that's in CAS work, that's in UDL theory and practice, the book. Um, if you read the literature on UDL, there's pretty much agreement on the field that those are, those are characteristics of UDL. So those were the two categories that we, we thought everyone could agree on. And under each category, we came up with some criteria that we recommend that people address. Who are the participants of whatever you're doing? Give us some information about them. Tell us about your, the setting in relation to UDL. What kind of classroom is it? What kind of school setting is it? Um, number two is the actual, it, the interesting and kind of tricky one. So 2A and 2B, are somewhat abstract concepts because th there are so many ways that people address barriers and there are so many ways that people conceive of increase of inc increasing access. Um, and similarly uh, for B, what variability is and how people address variability is there's a lot of variability in that. So that, those were tricky ones to write. And if you read the um, descriptions in 2A and 2B, we tried to keep it broad enough that no matter how somebody conceptualizes it, they can, um, they might be meeting those two criteria. Again, we didn't want to specify what you should be saying about those two things, just that you were saying something about those two things. Um, we even put for 2A uh, that you don't have to use the word barriers, you don't have to use the word access, as long as you're addressing those things in whatever terminology you use, that's what, that's what we're hoping would be in a UDL reporting or a study or something that you write. And then finally, number three is describing what was UDL about that thing that was implemented. What were the components? What were the UDL components? Um, in, when you're reporting on the outcomes of a study, uh, many times people will tell you that something worked, this practice worked, but they may not go and say, what, what UDL components do you think actually work? So we are, we're hoping people will be a little more clear about what aspects of UDL worked if you say that something worked. Um, so without further ado, let's try using these. I think it'll make a little more sense when you actually apply them to um, some articles. So what we've done is we took excerpts from three different articles so that you could apply these different criteria and see if you can find some of these factors. So if everybody could take a moment and go to this tiny URL here. And Mackenzie is gonna put that in the chat box. That's the examples 
hyphen UDLRC. Yeah, it's there now, folks. Okay, and I'm going to share my document. You can go to the document, but I'll also share my screen so that you can see it. So when you go to this, go to pay example number one. I'll give Looks everybody like a chance. Of us to are there. Get That's good. Okay, I think I see a lot of people on it. And I also shared it in case you're not able to get onto the Google Doc, you can see it shared on my screen. So take this first example, and I just pulled out one of the criteria. Usually you would apply all of them to an article. I just pulled out a small excerpt from an article and um, take a minute to skim page one and see if, uh, what, how, do, how do these authors address variability? Take a moment and we'll discuss it in a moment. So once you're done taking a look at that and considering that, um, how have authors described aspects of, desi of um, design that address variability? This can include a description of how flexibility, choice, or engagement is addressed in this practice or intervention. If you have, um, you, can, you can type on, in the chat box if you see some examples of how they've done this, how these authors have done this. Um, we're also going to try to have you all speak. So Mackenzie's going to help with this. If you, if you have a comment you'd like to make about this, if you'll use your hand raise function, Mackenzie can magically make your microphone work, we believe. So yes, you, I believe yeah. there should be a feature at the bottom of the Zoom window that you have pulled up that allows you to raise your hand. So we have one right now. So I'm, oh, yep. So I'm going to allow you to talk. Okay. You are muted, but you are permitted to talk. Uh, MB727, I don't know who that is. I can also unmute you. We might not, if you don't have a microphone hooked up, it might not work as well. Uh, I have a mic, interesting. No, I guess it's not gonna work. Meanwhile, if anybody wants to uh, type in the chat box, you can as well. Okay. Oh, I think we can hear you actually. Yeah, we can. Go ahead, talk. I think we can hear you. Me? Yes. Oh, I was yes, just I using um, the text to speech is talked about, correct? Um, right. Text highlighting, um, the uh, changing font size and contrast. Yes, excellent. So that uh, when we were writing this study, this is one of the exemplars where this is addressed, we felt like they gave very specific examples of the flexibility that they were providing within the intervention. So that would rate as a yes. So perfect. Those are exactly the kinds of things we're looking for. Um, so did somebody else raise their hand? I heard a ping. Mackenzie? Yeah. Nope. She was the only one. And we've got Ruby saying dictionary, multimedia, and glossary. Right, so these, this is great. You, you folks are finding the things that people have said, and this is really rich. I picked one that had so many examples of how flexibility was addressed. These authors, um, this is uh, Tracy Hall and her colleagues from CAST, they really uh, explain a lot about how they're addressing variability through their intervention. They, they actually, it goes on beyond this. I just, I just cut and paste a little bit so that we weren't reading for a long time. But this, is, this would be an example of um, a really, a lot of the variability is addressed here, how they're addressing variability is addressed in this, in this um, example. Let's go to example number two, which is on page two, and we're going to take a look at another checkpoint, uh, I'm sorry, another cr uh, criteria, which is 2C, and this one is looking for authors providing details about how and which of the nine UDL guidelines or the 31 checkpoints are applied. 
um, and they can do this however they want. They can talk about goals, assessments, methods, or materials. So take a quick skim of this um, excerpt from an article and tell us what you think. Does it meet or not meet and why? Okay, it looks like Don raised his hand, so I'm going to allow him to talk. All right, Don, you are permitted to talk, but it looks like you're muted. Okay, am I live now? Yep, there you go. Hey! I think hey, Don. <laughs> I love this article. I use it in my classes, so. <laughs> uh, I think they did a great job being really specific down into the checkpoints, which I've ex tried to do at different points and been told that I'm getting too into the weeds before. So I like the direction. One, I love what they did here, but I also really like the direction that you've taken this. So um, I think this is a good example of how they're specifically referencing individual checkpoints and providing a lot of clarity. Great. And Don, now you have ammunition to say, look, I'm supposed to do this. These reporting criteria tell me to put these checkpoints in, right? God bless you. <laughs> so, right. So thanks, Don. Yeah. So these authors, again, uh, as kind of an exemplar, they go above and beyond. They, they connect the checkpoints to very specific parts of their intervention. Um, and again, I just want to clarify, we're not expecting people to be this detailed. Like you don't, some authors may not, their intervention may not, or their practice may not uh, lend itself to being this detailed. They might have three things that they connect. That's totally fine. What we're looking for is that people are making a specific connection though. Um, another important point here is that we were looking for connections to the UDL guidelines. That's the nine guidelines or the 31 checkpoints. Um, the reason we said that is because many of the older articles talk about the three principles of UDL. They'll say we use multiple means of representation or we use multiple means of engagement. That's okay and that's good that they say that, but it's so broad that it's sometimes hard to know what they did for multiple means of representation or engagement. So we felt like giving guideline level information or checkpoint level information starts to build our knowledge of models that work. So that's why we um, suggest that. Sean? And we also want to reinforce, although, and I know it's been said, but we're not looking for manuscript articles that actually, uh, as this one did, put in parentheses, okay, this is what we're trying to do, and this is in re reference to UDL, this checkpoint, or this guideline. That's not necessary. I just don't, I want to make sure that we understand and appreciate that. Yes, and, and thanks, Sean, you reminded me. So how, how people do it can be different. Um, there are some authors who will make a table and they'll list everything in a table and how it connects. There are some authors who will embed it. Some will write it out differently. So again, we weren't, weren't being specific about how it's done as long as it is done. So um, that said, let's go to number three. And um, Don, I'm so excited that you're here because we pulled something from an article of yours. So, um, so this one we're looking, we're going to 3B, which is in addition to describing the overall outcomes of an intervention, the authors describe UDL components in relation to, um, to, to the, their learners and, and what happened in the intervention. So read this excerpt and maybe give us some examples of how the authors did this. Anybody want to wager some comments on uh, whether these authors meet 3B and why and how? Well, one comment there in the chat window about the podcast. Right, they make a, a very specific connection to components of the intervention, which is a podcast, to uh, the results of what happened for students. Does and the author I, want to offer any commentary? What's that? Does the author want to offer any commentary? Yeah, Don, do you want to jump in? <laughs> All right, Don. Okay. Sorry, I've been unmuted. I muted myself again, I think. Uh, yeah, I kind of wish I had done what uh, Marino uh, et al. did and just actually put in the little things, but I was actually 
I, I was thinking about this particular one as I was talking about it. Um, this, this is one of the ones I, I think I was into the weeds a little bit. So um, I think one of the things I really liked about it was we provided, I thought we did a nice job of providing options for executive function, which I don't feel like I see as much in the literature sometimes. And, you know, students get a chance to use advanced test taking strategies, like coming back with a podcast, you can come back to the question, you can skip question five and move on to question six, or listen to it three or four times. Whereas teacher read aloud, you, everyone goes at the pace of the slowest student generally for each question. So this is great. So the thing that Don, Don's group did when they wrote this is really be clear which part of the results, which of, of their study and their intervention, which UDL components seem to work for the students. And that's helpful for us to know as a field, because if they had just said, oh, yeah, the podcasts work, that's great. We know they work. But it's also helpful for us to know what, what works, because if we're replicating this or we're doing something similar, we know which components of the study the authors feel were useful or workable. So um, other thing I wanted to point out that I thought was kind of a nice contrast to Marino's study is you notice that Don and his colleagues don't put the checkpoint numbers in here. So, and that's fine. Where you don't have to put the numbers in as long as you're using the wording. So they're saying things like options for executive function, options to support planning and strategy development. Those are the, the terms from the UDL um, framework. So that's great because we know what they're talking about. So we wanted to be clear that again, we're being non-prescriptive. They don't have to do something in an exact way as long as they're referencing the UDL framework um, clearly. Yep, and it looks like Don wants to chime in on that as well. Uh, just a quick question, and I, I have to actually run here in a second, so I just wanted to get my question in, and I, maybe you'll cover it again in a second, but what if at some point in the future, I wanna look at just one specific checkpoint and go deep, as long as I'm clearly referencing it, would that still be, you know, my concern sometimes is when I when we get very discreet on a specific intervention, it can feel like, is this UDL enough? If that makes sense. So I will I'll jump in on that and then I'll let everybody else chime in. My feeling on that is it's a that's a design question. So if if you're addressing whatever barriers or the variability with that one checkpoint then that's what you're doing. So I guess that, that that's again my personal opinion. Um, that we're not prescriptive about which checkpoints to use or how many. So that anybody else want to chime in on Don's question there? Well, well certainly. I think if you take a look at the reporting criteria, the, what uh, Kavita mentioned is a key component in terms of the beginning. It's, it's the, the barriers and the variability are, are an element, including then what part of UDL. So you do not, it's, and you went finite with your uh, question, Don, but that's, I think, a question amongst the field is way met here. So I'm doing one of two principles, one of three principles, or I'm doing two or three, or I'm just doing a guideline. And, and that is very appropriate. And I think that was a, very much part of the consideration of the reporting criteria as we uh, considered kind of the, 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 the ins and outs that, yes, you would be able to do that as long as some of those other elements are considered uh, when you take a look at the, especially the beginning part of the criteria. So. Yeah, and I think one of the concerns we had as a group was this, this question keeps coming up. Do I have to use a checkpoint from every column? Do I have to use two checkpoints from every column? And we wanted to emphasize that that's not, we're not, there's no quantity or there, you don't have to quantify how many have to be from anywhere, or how many you have to use. Some people say it's not UDL if you don't use all 31. So again, we were trying to dispel all of those ideas that there has to be a certain quantity or amount. And we wrote the criteria to allow you to use one if that is what is works for your intervention. So I hope that kind of answers your question, Don. And all for everybody here, if you have thoughts or comments on the wording of these criteria or questions, um, please do use our feedback form and write it up because we'll be looking to um, revise these and refine these with feedback from the field. So we would love anything you have to say around this. Even if you think of it later, our Google Doc will be up and um, we would love any kind of feedback you have on these little details. Hey, Kavita, can I just jump in as a practitioner and answer that question? Sure. If, if you're very honed in and focused on one checkpoint, but addressing uh, one or two or three of these criteria, as a practitioner, that's actually very helpful. 
because you're basically giving us something really specific that we can then take and actually utilize um, in the schools. So uh, again, looking at the, the, the sort of the three headings in terms of variability, uh, the intentional design and the implementation and outcomes, if you're addressing that through a checkpoint, that's gonna be very helpful. Because sometimes it's a little pie in the sky-ish. Uh, now you could get too deep into it with the checkpoints, you'd have to be careful, but I think it'd be useful. So George, I'm gonna skip the next slide and give it to you to just so we can get your perspective since you got started on that. And then I'll, I'll go back to that slide. Do you wanna tell us a little more about using it from a practitioner's lens? Sure, um, I wasn't intending to have you jump me, uh, <laughs> but that's okay. Um, you know, one of the things that I was most excited about was being asked to participate in the work group. Um, and when I was uh, talking with some of our district leadership, our uh, superintendent said, why are you going to participate in a, a committee in a work group with a group of researchers um, and you're not a, you're a practitioner? And so we talked quite a bit about that and how exciting it was that a group of researchers actually wanted to have a practitioner involved and, and get a different point of view on uh, on what was useful and and again sometimes uh, those of us in the field might have a different definition of useful um, than some of the academics look at the look on sean's face uh, <laughs> but i think in the end it was really kind of neat because as we talked through these and came up with these three larger uh three three bigger pieces of criteria we actually all agreed when we're looking at the the implementation of udl you know, one of the first things we look at is, learn, is the learning environment and the acceptance of variability. So seeing that in, in a research article or in research that's conducted is really helpful for us to know, okay, this is about the bigger picture, this is about variability, and that's, a, that's, that's kind of a core component um, for us, for UDL. And then looking at those things that help us address barriers and then create options, which is, is written here as increasing access. Um, again, a very, very helpful um, piece for, for all of us. So, and jumping down to the findings, that's something we've been really looking at for a long time is, so what? So we think we're utilizing the UDL framework to design our learning environments and to design our instruction, but what's really happening with students? And so when we look at data and see the improvements in the various you know, test scores and local assessments and all the other kinds of things, and are able to go back and really um, connect it to sort of our, um, our sort of singular focus on making sure UDL drives all our work, that helps us. So then to be able to go and look at research and look at articles and be able to sort of analyze those articles using the same criteria that we um, analyze our own uh, daily work with really brings research and practice together, which, which is um, you know, my thinking and the purpose of research is to improve practice. So the criteria for, lo for looking at research is basically the same criteria we use um, to look at our, our pra or the practical application or utilization of UDL. So it blends very nicely, um, and which I think is really cool that we have university and practitioners working together and we end up starting at our own points, um, kind of talking about it and coming to the same conclusion. And just a little side note, this isn't really a practitioner one, but I wrote myself a little note because earlier on, I think somebody mentioned something about where UDL is, is utilized, but we do a lot of work in our community, particularly with our businesses. And we now have our businesses um, looking at UDL and these criteria are the same kinds of things we're talking with our, our businesses like Cummins and other businesses in the community about is that they have um, worker variability and they need to look at their learning environment, which is our work environment and their, their design of their world and how they evaluate success also has to connect here. So we're seeing even a bigger connection from research to practitioner in schools to now into our community and our business world. So it, I think it just really lends um, some credibility to the, the criteria that this group came up with. Now I'll be Thank quiet. No, thanks, George. This is actually great uh, information to share because, as you said, you were sitting in a group full of academics and we sometimes went deep into the weeds. So it was great to have George pull us back out into the practical aspects. Um, Chris, I'm going to hand it over to you so you can tell us a little bit about this in your the UDL reporting criteria in your context. 
Okay, thank you. I've kept it quite broad and I'm trying to come and hit that research to practice relevance for, for us in terms of the Australian context where we've got a very big Commonwealth move on um, national consistent collection of data where it has to be empirically based research practices that are um, implemented in schools. So the importance of having um, quality research design that's accessible and understood by all practitioners is really quite paramount. That's um, continued that conversation that's gone, gone on and on and on where, you know, we've worked with incredibly great teachers who have said, you know, we read all about this research and often it doesn't find its way into our classrooms because some of these researchers are so far removed from the contextual realities of crowded curriculum, etc. Then I've worked with fantastic um, researchers who, who say, you know, we put all of this effort into um, publishing all this quality research to improve practice, but it's, I can't understand why it's not being implemented in our classroom context. So it's that notion of crossing the divide when the irony is um, both researchers and practitioners are all saying the same thing. We want to motivate um, student engagement and success by breaking down barriers. And so the reporting criteria, I think, is quite attractive in that it's quite accessible in terms of it helps the research design um, impact in I suppose impact and um, guide effective practice that's accessible to um, practitioners as well as researchers and its core is on that notion of um, learner variability and where le learner variability and intentional design meet um, to really have its greatest impact on um, you know on the teachers and the um, classroom practice where we're actually moving toward and it's done that done that through that really clear consistent quality um, research criteria that's that's there in the reporting criteria um, because essentially we're all kind of striving to the same thing and and as George said the purpose of research is to improve practice but then it's the the research within classrooms um, that actually um, at the practice within classrooms also in informs research so it, I see it as a cyclic thing the other thing that I think that the reporting criteria um, is helpful in is that it's got a really explicit use of language from my perspective what I find is that um, the notion, some notions of like words like inclusion can mean one thing to one particular um, school of people or one group of people, yet it's quite loosely interpreted in another group. So the explicit use of language that can be um, interpreted with great clarity in terms of the reporting criteria, I think is, is fantastic. And I, I've got those two pictures in there um, because I was asked to look at the perspectives from the field and I'm seeing increasingly that the research and the practice domains are actually getting closer through that notion of collaboration. And um, I actually also believe that although that we can look at the, the three individual sections as individual sections, I do also think that um, I suppose the whole in its entirety for practice over the duration of a year is greater than the sum of the equal parts. So although we, um, from a research perspective, we actually, um, it's really beneficial to, to unpack different elements. I think that when it all comes together, we really do see um, significant gains um, in terms of the practical implementation of the essence of um, research. So I'm hoping that kind of makes makes sense in terms of where we're going within Australia. Um, the, the criteria, reporting criteria, is actually building a collective approach in terms of the use of language. It's almost like a, a segue in terms of where research is going. It's, it's providing that consistency in approach so that practitioners can in what to look for and the researchers have got a guide, guiding framework that um, you know, they can work to um, that will hopefully increase traction and volume within the field um, of both practice and research. Okay, great, Chris. That's wonderful. I think you're bringing together kind of the, the fact that we need consistency so that both groups know what we're talking about and what UDL is. And you actually gave me the best segue back to the slide I skipped when I jumped over <laughs> to George. Um, so 
one of the things we found, and the, so Chris brought up the language piece, which was really important. It wasn't easy to come up with the language of these criteria either, because do we use inclusion? What does the word inclusion mean? Do we use the word barriers? What does barriers mean? So we had to be really careful in using wording that would be meaningful to everybody, but it's the, the reality is if all, all of us here, all 18 of us present here tried to use this, we would have slightly different interpretations. So um, one of the things, a group of four of us used these criteria on a set of about 21 articles this summer just to see what happened with, with our interpretations. And I just wanted to give you some examples of ways that we had, we actually, we used them independently and came together to discuss interpretations. Um, so for example, with 2A addressing barriers, um, a couple of the people rating the articles were, were asked, um, well, if they don't address specific barriers for specific students, do, they, do we rate them as yes? And we decided as a group that yes, because UDL is not necessarily about barriers for specific students, it can be for a group as well. So we found that we had to kind of discuss the, the, our interpretations as a group. So if any of you are using these criteria with several people to rate, um, there definitely needs to be some inner rating and understanding the criteria together. Um, another example I'll give you is 2C. So looking at the application of UDL guidelines and checkpoints, that one seems easy because you either use those guidelines and checkpoints or not. And it's pretty easy to find if people have them. But then we found another variation that people do. We found a few articles where people kind of vaguely use the terminology of the checkpoints, but it's a little bit of a mashup. There's like che one checkpoint terminology mashed up with the second one. And we decided that's a no because the vagueness is what has made the UDL research base a little bit hard to compile. Uh, so we decided as in our, in our group of four for the articles that we were rating that people have to be specific to the checkpoints or guidelines as defined by CAST. So use the CAST wording. Um, and then the, actually the last one was really interesting. We, when you're looking at 3A and 3B, we wanted people to talk about UDL in relation to the outcomes of whatever they were doing. And a couple of us in the group, a uh, couple of people said, well, they, des they described some of their outcomes in relation to UDL, but not all. So is that a yes or no? So then we discussed as a group that the reality is sometimes you're doing a practice and not everything about that practice has a UDL outcome. So for example, you might be looking something that is something that has an academic and behavioral outcome. And let's say that just in theory, you, you applied UDL to an academic piece. So you only need to report on UDL in a way that's relevant. You don't have to report on it for every outcome, but the outcomes that are UDL related. So again, I wanted to highlight that there are interpretational things with the wording that um, if you're using them, you might want to talk with others who use them. Um, and again, the flex, I wanted to highlight the flexibility. We're not trying to make this a rigid document. We wanted it to be flexible enough that it works for all different people using the document. And Kavita, um, if I, I could just offer a, just a, a, a piggyback on that. One, the, the individuals that were involved with it, and I, I was one, I'd have to say our, our folks have been around UDL for a while. And, and, and so it was interesting in terms of the conversation that followed. And, and two, I just want to reinforce that, that flexibility, not only in the literature, but also how potentially, at least we were trying to use this criteria, uh, there, there should, we, we, we try to design it with a manner that allows for that flexibility for that conversation. So um, I hope you are engaging with other colleagues if you start to use this, because I think you'll find um, a lot of conversation. So thank you. And one thing we would appreciate, if you're looking through the wording of these criteria, those of you who are joining us on the webinar or out there in the YouTube live stream, and you see things about the wording that you'd like to give us feedback on, we would love the feedback. This is not a, like a document that we hope to update it, and we hope to get feedback from you all in the field. So uh, please do use the, the Google Doc that we have for feedback. Um, Mackenzie, if you can put that link in the chat box, I'd appreciate it, because we will be reviewing that now and later to see if, you, if people say, oh, you know, that word really bugs me. I don't know what that means. Let us know because again, as Sean mentioned, most of us were very familiar with UDL. So sometimes we might miss some definitional things that others in the field would like defined better or, or further. Okay, so to wrap up, um, I just kind of want to bring home the point that we, we made these criteria for many different groups, researchers, practitioners, um, and also for journal editors. And this goes back to what Dawn was saying. Um, sometimes people will say, you're saying too much, you're not saying enough. But the criteria can also give people who are editing journals and they get articles, um, they might say, you know, you need to say what is UDL about your intervention. And the reporting criteria will give the journal editor some teeth on what needs to be said. Um, 
It gives researchers clarity on what to address in a manuscript and how to design a study. And it lets practitioners know what is UDL about things being done. So again, we are hoping that it will be useful broadly across the field. And our hope also the next steps of the reporting criteria is that we'll get input as uh, Kavir was just mentioning from users, from folks that actually would utilize it's, it's there on the IRM website. Uh, hopefully, you know, sh uh, spread the word. Um, it's been there for a little bit. But as folks are using it and the expectation of their use, feedback would be uh, just tremendous. Um, and uh, potential, you know, not only uh, use, but also application of use, how they're using it, potentially different directions of how people are uh, beginning to use it. Again, uh, we've been thinking of the stakeholders. Of course, we had a variety of stakeholders that actually helped develop it. But again, I think the more use, potentially more interpretation. Uh, more adjustments, so very open to that and, and, and um, very open to hopefully we've started a conversation that might continue and, 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 and further adjust. So, um, and we know some colleagues out there that were just chomping at the bit to be able to get a hold of this <laughs> and we're waiting for them to use it and give us feedback because uh, you know, different perspectives will be very much welcome. Chris and George, do you want to add anything more as we wrap up about the criteria? Um, I think the process in which it was evolved uh, 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 um, was quite comprehensive and I think that it um, also reflects the fle flexibility which hopefully then um, I suppose portrays it, its usage as well. So um, very open to, to um, additional feedback in terms of allowing that growth to continue. Yeah, I, I would basically reiterate everything that's just been said. The, the development, um, and this is a sick thing, was really a fun process. Um, <laughs> you know, we had some good debates. We had good information sharing. Um, it was a lot of time, and it was absolutely well worth it. And I would encourage um, the folks who are, are participating and others is to make sure you share this um, reporting criteria with school districts. Okay, and, and get feedback on what do they think? Is this a useful way to, to sort of guide some research that'll help us? Um, so those of you who are in Kansas and Hawaii and other universities, put it out to some practitioners and get their feedback um, and see what they think because you know, they're, they're the implementers. So I think they, their voice is important. And um, for the uh, university folks, um, run it by some of your students and some of your classes. Um, see what they're thinking about it. Um, and be open to, to their feedback. Okay, we're gonna hang around for some questions, but before we take your questions, I just wanted to thank, UDL IRN has been tremendous in supporting our group to come together. We are part of the research committee of the UDL IRN, so I wanted to thank the IRN, and also Mackenzie, who's like this magical person in the background who makes everything really smooth. So thank you, Mackenzie, um, for helping make, make this happen. She, she uploads new versions in a minute. Like if we make a change on this, she's got it up in like five minutes. So um, thank you for your support. And I just wanted to shout out, Mackenzie wanted me to, well, actually Mackenzie, you're here. So do you want to just talk about the summit real quickly and then we'll take yeah, questions? Absolutely. That would be great. So we have our UDL IRN summit um, this upcoming March, the 27th through the 29th. Early bird tickets are going to be pulled down this upcoming December 5th. That's next Wednesday. So make sure to buy your early bird tickets now and um, hopefully we'll have a great schedule put together for you um, by January. So look for that as well. It's a great location, folks. Yep, Orlando, Florida. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, and with that, we're kind of done with the official talking at you piece. Um, if, uh, we love questions and feedback and comments, so we're gonna hang around um, if there's anything you'd like to add or ask. I'm gonna throw one more thank you in um, and absolutely agree a million percent about Mackenzie. She makes us look really good. Um, but Kavita, you did a marvelous job pulling this all together. Uh, not just tonight, but the whole process. Um, you have been the person who's done most of the work um, and we get to smile. So I really do thank you for everything that you've done. Thank you, George. It's very nice. Yeah, I echo that. I do too. Thanks, Kavita. <laughs>